Hello, welcome to Teaching American History Saturday webinar, a webinar and podcast series that explores controversies in American history. Today, we are joined by our host, John Stevens of Ashland University, and panelists John Dynan of Wake Forest University and Joe Postel of Hillsdale College. For this month's controversy, we've chosen to focus on federalism, its role in American history, and how it shapes modern issues like abortion, marijuana access, and gun control. So, to what extent does the U.S. Constitution permit state officials to question the legitimacy of federal laws and take actions that defy those laws? All right. Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome. My name is uh, Jason Stevens. I'm a Assistant Professor of Political Science and History at Ashland University in Ashland, Ohio. Welcome to our November episode of this year's Saturday webinar series, which we call American Controversies. Uh, by bringing together thoughtful scholars with differing points of view, we hope to have a discussion, a conversation really, uh, about historically important issues that still resonate in the current classroom. We encourage all of you uh, out there uh, to participate in that conversation, to be part of that discussion uh, by uh, submitting questions. Any questions that you might have, you can submit here in the Zoom Q&A function. Uh, please use that uh, to contribute your questions. Don't use the chat box. Uh, please use the Q&A function and we will we'll try to get to as many of those as, as we can. And then uh, within the next week or so, you'll receive an email with links for further reading, uh, as well as a link to the archive video and audio from today's program. In the registration form, we have linked to the speeches, the letters, the other writings that we're going to be using for today's conversation. That conversation, it's going to be rooted in those documents. Uh, many of them are also available uh, on our website, teachingamericanhistory.org or tah.org. Uh, it's an extensive document database um, that's especially designed for teachers. Uh, also, please check out our core document collection. Today, we will be discussing this question. To what extent does the U.S. Constitution permit state officials to question the legitimacy of federal laws and take actions that defy those laws? A really important question uh, for us to think about today. And joining me on our panel uh, is John Dynan. He is professor of politics at Wake Forest University, uh, as well as Joe Postel. Joe Postel is here. He is an associate professor of politics at Hillsdale College. Uh, both are our old friends of uh, TAH. Both are also faculty members in Ashton University's master's program in American history and government program, the MAG program. Gentlemen, thank you both so much for joining us this morning. It's very good to be here. Uh, before we get started, um, would you please take a moment to answer two questions that are about to pop up on your screen? Uh, our staff at TAH is trying to get a sense of what type of professional development we should offer to our webinar participants. Your feedback will help us determine how to best serve our educator audience. So again, take a minute or so, answer, uh, answer those two questions that have popped up on your screen. And at that point, we'll go ahead and start our conversation, but we'll go silent here for the next 40 seconds or so. All right. Thank you very much for taking the time to answer those questions. Uh, let's get the conversation going here. Let's get the, the ball rolling, so to speak. So uh, to our two panelists, again, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, I want to start maybe with a, a, a broad, open-ended question uh, just to get things going here. Or maybe it's really two questions, come to think of it. Um, our guiding question this morning, let me read this again one more time. I'm just trying to wrap my mind around it. Uh, to what extent does the U.S. Constitution permit state officials to question the legitimacy of federal laws and take actions that defy these laws? Okay, guys, so that's that's a little wordy to me, but it, it sounds a bit complicated, but really important as well. Help us understand what this question is, is asking. Boil it down to its essence for us. Help us understand first, what exactly the question is, and second, why that is an important question for us to think about, not just for teachers and students, but really for all Americans. I'm glad to, to, to take a first shot at that. 
And there's two uh, kind of ways to come at this question. And one way to come at this question is because this was a very important question in the early American Republic. Uh, as members of the founding generation, uh, officials in the next generations, tried to figure out what type of constitutional system have we created and what role is there played for state officials and residents of various states to be playing an important role in determining when the federal government, officials in the federal government have exceeded their powers and have done wrong. And when that has happened, what are the avenues by which uh, redress can be pursued? It was, as we can see from the documents today, an open question for many about what role state governments could play in that regard. So that's one origin of the question. Another way that the reason this question is, is taken up today is because there are officials, state officials and residents of states today in the 2022 and in recent decades who have questioned actions of the federal government, who've questioned uh, laws that have been passed by Congress, who have questioned uh, decisions passed by the US Supreme Court, and who have said we have an ability to push back against these and to question those. I'll just give a few very quick examples just to set the, the table for us. In the it, congressional law still does say that marijuana is, a, pen, is penalized uh, by a federal criminal prosecution. That law has, is, the controlled substances law has been on the books for 50 years. It is remains law and yet a number of states have passed laws saying in our state there will not be criminal penalties for marijuana use. In some cases it's for medical use, in many other states it's for recreational use. Second example, at various times, I'll just give an example, uh, Congress had a law in the books up until recently that said that only four states that were grandfathered in could allow sports betting. And then New Jersey, about a decade ago, passed a law that said, well, we uh, we do plan to allow sports betting in New Jersey, it, and then we're not one of the kind of the states that was grandfathered in. And the uh, that, that that law was at variance then with 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 Congress's uh, direction. Uh, one or two other examples in regard to immigration law. Uh, there are a number of federal immigration laws that provide for for how and this has some resonance with the alien acts, which are the starting off our, 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 our reading today, in, in which it, it, it requires certain things to be done, notifications to be made of federal officials when someone is being in custody and when there's information about that person not being in the country legally. A number of state and local officials have said, we will not be assisting federal officials. And we'll pass formal laws saying uh, it is not permitted for state officials to assist with these laws. I'll stop here, but there's uh, there's this is this is a question that comes up in the 1790s and early 1800s. It's also a question that comes up today, and so that's the context for our discussions today this morning. Yeah, so I'll jump in here. That was a fantastic sort of introduction, uh, and John pinpoints sort of the key contemporary issues that have been. Uh, uh, affected by this question of the relationship between federal government and the states and um, what states can do in terms of not implementing, resisting, opposing, obstructing federal law, uh, you know, marijuana, immigration, um, sports betting, uh, maybe less high profile, but certainly one of these issues uh, where that's come up. Um, you know, to add to that, a couple of other interesting, uh, maybe not immediately contemporary, but somewhat recent issues. Uh, when the Obergefell decision is handed down by the Supreme Court, uh, there's one person that I think got the most attention. I believe she was alone, right? Kim Davis in Kentucky says, well, I'm not issuing the marriage licenses, right? I'm a state official or I'm a local official. I can, uh, I have my own powers and I will carry them out according to my own, my own views, not that of the United States Supreme Court. And of course, that evokes resistance by many of the states to the decision in Brown versus Board of Education, uh, you know, in the 1950s. So, so states throughout American history have uh, resisted at times federal federal laws and tried to use whatever powers they had at their disposal to um, to direct the law more in terms of their view of, of how it should be implemented or whether it should even exist at all. Um, the question, so so I think it's very clear why this question is relevant uh, to these specific issues, and then more broadly, I think 
there's a sense among a lot of people that the balance of power between the federal government and the states has certainly changed over the last couple of centuries. And people who are sort of disappointed at the centralization of power in the national government, um, and I think we can debate to the extent to which that's actually happened, but, but I think most people would say the federal government is much more powerful today than it was, uh, say, a century or two ago, and uh, people tend to be frustrated by that. They tend to think, well, what can my state government do to bring the power back closer to home or something like that. And so these debates are certainly relevant for thinking about the legal and constitutional questions there. Um, back to the question itself, right? So we've been talking about why the question matters. The question itself, I sort of have chuckled a few times when reading the question that Jason uh, uh, read because it's put so carefully and so delicately by the Ashbrook Center. It just reminds me of how careful James Madison is himself when he's right at the line here in the Virginia resolutions with what is it that we can do? We think that the Alien and Sedition Acts are unconstitutional. Um, we see so he, he has this word, right? Interpose. Uh, and it's this delightfully ambiguous word. What does that mean? What are we doing here? And I think, um, you know, the, the, the question is, does not discuss, say, secession, nullification directly, right? It's just what can states do uh, to speak out or to oppose? And so I think there are a lot of different ways we can take that question, but it's, it's stated at a very um, broad level. And I think because this is a very delicate issue. And so um, the, you know, the details here start to cause people to be quite uncomfortable in terms of how, how far one wants to go and how far the Constitution allows people to go. Yeah, thank you both. Two fantastic answers there. And I, I do hope that we can swing back around later in the webinar to some of these contemporary issues, right, involving involving this question. But maybe to get things started here, we're, we've got several questions already coming into the, the Q&A function here. And right to our audience out there, please keep those questions coming. We're going to be taking questions from the audience uh, throughout the duration of this, this webinar. Um, but uh, one of those questions asks, why was the Alien and Sedition Acts considered so controversial at the time? So the question that we're dealing with here uh, is a question that really Americans have been struggling about, thinking about since the founding, right? And this is a question, as you two gentlemen have remarked, hasn't gone away. So in regards to this question from our audience, please, both of you, take us back Take us back to 1798, the early American Republic. Uh, what's going on in the country at that time? Uh, and how does that lead up to the, the Alien and Sedition Acts? What are those acts exactly? Uh, and as our, our audience member asked, why were they so controversial? I guess I could, uh, oh. Joe, please. Okay, sure. Um, so, you know, the, the Alien Sedition Acts are passed in, uh, I think they're enacted in 1798, right? Um, this is sort of midway through the John Adams presidency. Uh, Washington managed to sort of keep something of a lid on partisan con conflict during his presidency, although the extent to which he was successful even in doing that is, is open to discussion. But of course, once Adams becomes president, uh, the two parties, you know, the Jeffersonians and the Federalists, go into pretty uh, serious conflict. And one of the uh, central methods of engaging in this partisan conflict was to basically set up partisan press. And the press by the seven, late 1790s has gotten pretty out of hand. Um, some of the accusations that are made about both uh, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams around this time heading into the election of 1800 are, um, well beyond, I would say, the kinds of things we we're willing to say about each other in politics today. I actually think the election of 1800, the attack ads are nastier in 1800 than they than they are even today. Um, and so uh, the the Alien Act, um, of course, the country is at some sort of quasi war, right, with uh, with France, and so. Um, there are concerns about uh, non-citizens being in the country, and the, there's a sort of process there for um, for detention and removal. Um, I think more controversial, really. We tend to lump the Alien and Sedition Acts together, but it's really the Sedition Act that I think that, that sparks the most controversy, because and, and this is clear in the Virginia Resolutions, right? That it's aiming at the press and the the freely examining public people and public measures. Um, 
in defense of the the sedition act there is a provision in the law that says truth is a defense so um if you say something that can that's true right you can actually be um sort of exonerated although one wonders whether the burden of proof should be on the person right speaking to prove that their their allegations are true so it's clearly chilling public speech and public debate uh and of course, the worry here is that the Federalists will use this power to chill the press as a way of keeping themselves in power and preventing the, the Jeffersonians from, from winning the next election. And so um, it's a highly controversial uh, law. And I think this is um, a real moment of tension in the country because there's never been a peaceful transition of power. There's never been an election in which the party in power has lost and had to give power over to the other party. And so so to what extent can the party in power suppress opposition? I think that's really at the bottom of all of this, uh, one of the central questions. Yeah, John, did you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, I, I think Joe, the only thing I would, I would just say to amplify when the Joe point is that we always talk about partisan polarization today and and one of the things that historical knowledge can help us is to to recognize when we're really in the presence of something new and when we're in the presence of something enduring in american politics and and for folks who who see kind of politics as vicious today as 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 very much a heated battle it's helpful to transport us back into the 1790s and this period in the late 1790s to remind us that when we think there's something new under the sun in American politics, sometimes there is, but in, in, in regard to, to pitched battles and, 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 and kind of heated argument, it'd be tough to top what we're seeing here in the 1790s. Yeah, we, we have a question. Another question just came in from one of our audience members asking sort of a question along those lines. This person asked, to what extent do you think the Alien and Sedition Acts were passed for political advantage for the Federalist Party? Uh, and I believe you, you two gentlemen could correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe that the sedition law, it, it, it applied, you couldn't criticize the president, John Adams, and you couldn't criticize Congress, but it said nothing about the vice president, who at the time, of course, is, is Thomas Jefferson. Am I right about this? It was still legal to criticize the vice president, Thomas Jefferson? <laughs> Well, I will say this, that, that there were certain folks who, uh, there, there's stories of people who were in a parade where somebody said at one point, the cannon was going off. And, and, and a bystander said, I, I sure hope that cannonball would hit, you know, President Adams kind of right in the, in, in, the, in the rear end in that way. And next thing you know, folks are saying, oh, that's, that's seditious speech in that way. So, so it's for press, but also that the, the, there's people who are concerned about just what you might say in the in the given public so it's this sets the tone for our discussion here in that way this was this concern about the sedition acts in particular was one people said these we believe these were passed uh the critics believe they were passed for partisan advantage and and, and they there's reason for them thinking that they also believed that this exceeded federal powers and uh, and encroached on rights that 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 were protected. So not only did did, did Congress not have the power to do so, but also that we had explicit uh, protections in in the Bill of Rights that would um, that would go against us. And so then the question turns: So what can we do about this if we're concerned? And as as we're going to get to, um, you know, we assume today: Oh, you just go to the courts and you handle that in that way. But that was uh, Madison, Jefferson, and others say that's not our only recourse. And so that's the context for the the um, the, the, the resolutions that we we have before us here. Is but the, those resolutions did not spring out of uh, um, those resolutions sprung out of real concern and and real constitutional angst about what had been done. Yeah, I actually just glanced back at the section two of the Sedition Act because I've never heard Jason's argument that the vice president is omitted from the list. And technically, I guess that's true, right? So it says, yeah, you no know, publishing any false, scandalous, and malicious writing or writings against the government of the United States or either House of Congress or the president. Right? So there is no vice president unless he's included in the general against the government of the United States, which maybe you could say he's you know, Jefferson's protected there. Um, so that's interesting. I actually don't think the Federalists are doing this entirely for partisan advantage. Mm. I think the Federalist thinking about the Federalist thought in the 1790s, I think easily lends itself to a kind of uh, sedition act 
along these lines, right? Um, they're less uh, willing to accept what might be called harmful speech. Their views on libel and slander, um, it's much easier for the government to prosecute speech that harms reputation. Um, reputation at this time is considered a sort of right, part of your right to life. So if somebody can say things about you that are not true to, to sort of tarnish your reputation, it's a sort of attack on your person, attack on your property or your liberty. So I think the Federalists, you know, as, as we often teach as the party of order and the party of sort of ordered liberty at this time, I think they philosophically were more interested in a kind of politics that was sort of elevated, the discourse uh, would be in a higher level, um, that certain kinds of people would be more inclined to participate in politics of, say, the higher classes and so on. And so the kind of mudslinging that they're trying to get out of politics, I think, isn't just for political advantage, but I think it's it's rooted in their view of, of how politics should be conducted in a republic. Um, and certainly, I think John Adams, you know, uh, a guy who I think really was a dignified um, uh, servant of the people and wanted other other people to behave in a sort of dignified way. I think he lamented the kind of democratic nature of, of the late 1790s politics. So but clearly there was some partisan advantage here, but I think there was also some, some philosophical commitment to raising the, the discourse of, of, uh, of politics. And then one last thing, um, you know, still the Whiskey Rebellion is actually sort of in the minds mm. of the Federalists at this time. I mean, it's been six years or, or five years now, but uh, remember that uh, Washington himself had said over and over again that it was people who were sort of arousing sedition um, would stir up popular, you know, opposition to the government. And then look what you get in Western Pennsylvania, this sort of outbreak of violence against federal officials. So I still, it hasn't been that long since that's happened. So some of that I think is still lurking in the background here for the Federalists for, for uh, some reasons why they were in support of this law. Interesting, really interesting stuff there. Um, okay, so, well, regardless of you know, the extent of its partisanship, you still have about 20, I think, 20 people who are thrown in prison for violating the, the sedition law at this time. Um, so walk us through the arguments of the Virginia Resolution. Right, the Virginia Resolution, which we I think was one of our documents for, for today. Maybe even we can bring in the Kentucky Resolutions as well as this, if you two would like. We didn't assign that. That wasn't something we, we, we've read for today. But if, you're, if you want to bring that in, please feel free to do so. I just want to read a, a, a section here from the Virginia Resolution. Um, this, is what, uh, this, is what's, this is written by James Madison, of course, although uh, I think it's right anonymous at the time. Uh, here's what it says. Uh, that this assembly doth explicitly and preemptorily declare that it views the powers of the federal government as resulting from the compact to which the states are parties. And then skipping down a little bit, and that in case of a deliberate, palpable, and dangerous exercise of other powers not granted by the said compact, the states who are parties thereto have the right and are in duty bound to interpose for arresting the progress of the evil and for maintaining within their respective limits the authorities, rights, and liberties appertaining to them. Gentlemen, what, is, what does that mean? What does Madison have in mind when he speaks of the right of the states to interpose for arresting the progress of that evil? Well, of course, that's going to be at the, at the heart of the discussion that's going to go on all the way through the 1830s in that way is what does this mean? Let me just go to one other quote from near the end of that to, to give some sense of what, what Madison will say later. He says, this is crucial to kind of what we were meaning by interpose. And that's in the second to last paragraph of the reading here. And he says, the General Assembly doth solemnly appeal to the like dispositions of the other states in confidence that they will concur with this Commonwealth in declaring, as it does hereby declare, that the acts aforesaid are unconstitutional and that the necessary and proper measures will be taken by each for cooperating with this state in maintaining the authorities, rights, and liberties referred to the states respectively or to the people. Now, I, I quote that because Madison will come back to that. He says, what we mean by interposition is, is Virginia and also Kentucky in resolutions that we don't hear, we're sounding the alarm to the other states. We were highlighting a constitutional violation 
we hope that everyone else will agree with us and then we will all take proper steps. Now, what those proper steps will be, uh, could be, uh, um, uh, could be uh, working to amend the law in Congress. It could be uh, 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 at the next election, making sure that people are elected uh, president and Congress who will honor principles and, and take steps. But Madison's key point here is he's saying, we are appealing to the other states, at least in this, per this particular portion here, for concerted effort. Uh, a violation has occurred. We believe it's, 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 it's a violation has occurred. We're rallying the states. Let's take action. Yeah, that's really good. So this is one of the critical distinctions that Madison draws between he and Calhoun, is that Calhoun's doctrine of, of nullification, which of course comes up in, in the early 1830s, is a doctrine about the right of a single state to nullify a law inside uh, its uh, jurisdiction. The Kentucky resolutions, which you mentioned, Jason, a little while ago, written by Jefferson, do take that next step and talk, they talk about nullification. Um, so the Virginia resolutions from Madison are seen as the kind of more moderate or hesitant or sort of, you know, um, reluctant uh, uh, of the two. And Madison very clearly in later letters says, uh, he refers to the legislative history of the Virginia resolutions and he says there was a there was a provision or you know a, a line in the Virginia resolutions that said that the alien and sedition acts were also null and void and the Virginia legislature deletes that line from the Virginia resolutions because they don't want to take the step of saying we think Virginia can nullify the alien and sedition act so Madison is a strong opponent of nullification he's a, an opponent of Calhoun's doctrine um, and so this appeal to the other states that we all will work together and cooperate is really important here and and uh, gives Madison a sort of an out later on to say I, I'm not with I'm not with Calhoun um, the most interesting thing to me part of the Virginia resolutions is this very very weird a sort of subtle, ambiguous reference to the nature of the compact, right? So this is the core question that divides them at the time the Constitution is being debated. It's the core question that divides Calhoun and Madison, because uh, in Calhoun's Fort, Fort Hill address, he's going to say the, the states made the national government, therefore the states can sort of take the power back whenever they want. And Madison does say that the states made the government, but he says it in a really weird and curious way, and it's in this very subtle that the compact uh, to which the states are parties. So the states are the parties to the federal compact. Uh, he uses the plural there instead of the, each state is a member of the compact, the states altogether are parties to the compact, which I think implies that states have obligations to each other and therefore can't unilaterally make decisions like leaving the union. So secession is out, nullification is probably out as well. Um, this was something Madison had to really grapple with in the Federalist Papers, right? When uh, there was a discussion about, well, is this a national constitution or a federal constitution that we're creating? Uh, Madison appeals to the, the way in which the constitution is ratified. And he says, well, it's not ratified by the people as a whole. And it's also not ratified by the state governments. It's ratified by this other body that is the state's conventions. And so, He's going to try to make an argument about the way in which we ratified the Constitution means nullification is not on the table, but it also means that the states are parties to the compact and therefore can judge when the compact has been violated, just like if we all entered into a contract, I guess we would be able to judge whether the provisions were violated, although of course there is some body that gets to decide whether we were in breach of contract as well that's above all of us, and so here's here's the, all of the subtlety here presented. Um, uh, in this notion of a compact of states collectively. Let me, I, I might be jumping head for us to kind of take things to the to the state's responses to that, but I do so in the context of seeing some of the comments that are, and questions that have come up in the chat room. And that is one natural response to this, and it's a response that almost every state made in response was, uh, we have a Supreme Court. And that's the Supreme Court's role. Yes, it's very possible. All these states that we acknowledge that a, that a, that a, a Congress could exceed its powers. Most of them say we don't think it's happened here, uh, but we acknowledge it could happen. Uh, but we've provided for that. 
the Supreme Court is uh, that, that that's uh, it's very clear that they can do this. And so we can talk about kind of some of those responses come up, but 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 as always comes up, well, what about the the court? And at this time, I take Madison to be saying is that that's not the exclusive uh, redress that we have in our system, or at least we don't believe Madison is saying that that's the exclusive redress of taking things to to, to court. That we uh, states. Are, and one thing to take us back to is, is that the, um, and there's a great book, it's by Herman Ames, and Herman B. Ames, and he collects these documents on state-federal relations, and uh, he collects a number of these state replies, which are also in other sources, but he shows that in the early American Republic, it was very natural for states to issue resolutions in which they would express their concern about what was happening at the federal government level. And so when we take the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, it's, all, it's very important. The, these, these, the doctrines claimed here are, very, are, are stronger than some of the other resolutions here, but whenever something was was happening that was wrong states would issue resolutions and would say hey we're sounding the alarm there's a problem here we believe the federal government's gone too far uh new england states just about um, uh, uh less than a decade later would begin issuing resolutions uh with uh, issuing concerns about the embargo act and then eventually issuing uh, 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 expressing concerns about some of the actions taken during the War of 1812 in Lido. And so this was very much a natural thing. So, so Madison's argument and others, even though they might have objected here to some of the doctrines here, other states would also be issuing resolutions. It was very natural. Yes, the Supreme Court is out there. The Supreme Court certainly has a role, but the Supreme Court is not the exclu has, does not have exclusive ownership of interpreting the Constitution and beginning to take steps to uh, rectify violations of the Constitution. Okay, good, good. Let's let's talk about that because actually I'm noticing here we've got a question from one of our our teachers. Uh, and by the way, everybody out there, please continue to to send those questions in using the Q and A function. We're going to try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, but one of those questions asks: uh, We have in our documents the counter resolutions of seven of the states. Uh, what response did the others have to the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions in 1798, thinking especially of, of South Carolina? So we read through these documents, and it seems that a lot of them are opposed to what Virginia and Kentucky are doing. Some of them were silent, of course, right? Maybe didn't say anything. But did any of the states come out in support of Virginia and Kentucky, or did they virtually stand alone? Help us understand this. John, do you know the answer to that? I actually don't know whether South Carolina responded. You know, I don't, but there has been some recent scholarship, which I need to kind of look at, which is called attention to some other responses of states that are not collected in the usual documents. And I don't have any, any evidence that there's an affirmative support for this, but it is a recent scholars have begun to kind of unearth some of these other documents. And so it's a great question. It's a timely question. In fact, just in the last few years, um, a, a few scholars have begun to say, hey, what else is out there? Um, uh, uh, folks who are interested in this, I'll, I'll be looking into this more and 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 and, and it's grist for others as well. Great question. Yeah, one, one thing is uh, just to add on to this, you know, when you look at the states that do respond, it, it's universally negative. But, you know, it's Delaware, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Vermont, right, uh, uh, Connecticut, New York, with, you know, we all know why these are the states that are speaking out against it. These are all of the Federalist states up in the north. So, so obviously the states one would wonder about would be North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. Um, I, my guess is there's not a lot, but that's only because I've never come across anything. So uh, I, I think that clearly what Jefferson and Madison are trying to do is they're trying to strategically place these resolutions in as many state legislatures as they can. So if we don't have, say, we have a Kentucky and we have a Virginia, if we don't have the others that are well known, my sense is they, they don't exist, but it would be really interesting to, to look into it some more and find out if there are others. We, we've got a great question that just came in on this question regarding, right, is it the Supreme Court's role and not the states to decide these constitutional questions, these, controver these constitutional controversies between the federal government and the states? And this teacher asked the, the, the following question. The Supreme Court had not yet exercised its power of judicial review, had it? 
Marbury versus Madison was a few years away still. I think Marbury is in 1803. We're talking 1798, 1799 here. So was it clear that the Supreme Court had that power at the time? It was highly understood that the Supreme Court have the power to invalidate state acts in that way. And so that's, so the question here is, uh, we have a federal action, a, a congressional action. Um, certainly if one reads the, the, the debates of the, the Constitutional Convention, there are many, several statements at least, that give every expectation that the court would be playing a policing function. Now, some other folks say, oh, it's, I wish it had been clearly, more clearly stated, but there's a lot of support for that. And so when in Marbury versus Madison, the court lays down that doctrine of the ability of, of the courts to uh, review legislation by Congress, there's a lot of support for that. What's the, the key point here though is, is, to, is the Supreme Court the exclusive uh, interpreter of the Constitution, and that's the that's what's Madison and in in, in in pending the the report of 1800, just to put one of our other documents on the table, really seems frankly stunned by the responses of the other states, and so he's he's moved to kind of pen this response, and he works through. He said, well, we said this, this isn't objectionable, is it? And we said this, it, this can't be objectionable, and so Madison's view, I really do take. It. He said, well, yes, of course, that is one role of the Supreme Court to uh, review acts of, acts of uh, state legislation, acts of Congress, but it doesn't mean that they're exclusively responsible. Put another way, state officials did not, by signing onto the Constitution, give up their ability to read the Constitution, to look at events taking place, and to say, in our view, we believe this is a violation of the Constitution, and let's rally other other officials as a way of trying to get rid of these. So it's not the question so much of, of whether or not the court has the power of judicial review, it's whether the court is the exclusive interpreter of the Constitution and the only means of redress for violations of it. Yeah, I think, you know, there's this debate today between what people call departmentalism versus, say, the judicial supremacy or some other variant of that, which, you know, does every branch of the of the government have the uh, power to interpret the Constitution and to apply the Constitution? They all take an oath to, you know, to to do that, right, to to be faithful to the Constitution. Uh, or is this just something, you know, even if you think something is unconstitutional in Congress, you let the courts sort that out, right? You just vote for it based on whether you like it or not. Or if you're a president, do you sign the bill even though you think it's unconstitutional and let the courts sort it out? Um, this uh, this this question comes up in the in the responses. Most uh, the interesting thing you see in these state responses is they all almost all of them quote from the Constitution. They don't put the quotation marks around it, but they say. Right. The decision of all cases in law and equity arising under the Constitution and the laws is vested in the courts of is vested in the federal courts. So they're basically quoting Article three of the Constitution and saying, well, the courts have the power to decide all of the cases arising in, in law and equity under the Constitution and the laws. That's what this is. And so they get to decide that. Um, I do think Madison's position, though, is, uh, you know, can, can respond to this. Right. So the question is, in the cases in law and equity, right? The courts have a power to decide those, but it doesn't mean that the executive doesn't have the power to decide whether to prosecute based on the executive's view of, of constitutionality. And it doesn't mean that the states don't have some role to play in helping to you know, sort of express uh, sentiments about constitutional meaning as well, right? So everyone can sort of interpret the constitution. Uh, it's just the question of, when you, when you have a judicial power and you're exercising it, then you interpret the Constitution in the exercise of that power. And what Madison is saying is we can interpret the Constitution as state legislators, and then we can talk with each other about whether our interpretation is correct and let the people decide in the next election whether we got, we got it right or the Federalists did. And Madison's eventual conclusion in the 1830s is the people settled this one. They settled it by voting out the Federalists and then Jefferson, of course, um, when he becomes president, he pardons people who were prosecuted. And so I think in a way, Madison sort of wins in spite of the fact that all these states write these uh, denouncing, you know, resolutions against what he was what he was up to. Yeah, and maybe we've already answered this this next question that, that just came in from one of our from one of our teachers. But but John had mentioned Madison's 
um, Virginia report of, of 1800. What about James Madison? How did he respond to, to the aftermath of all of this? Maybe we could say something here about his 1800 report because a teacher asks, uh, in the report on the Virginia resolutions, Madison writes, quote, uh, where resort can be had to no tribunal superior to the authority of the parties, the parties themselves must be the rightful judges, end quote. And then this teacher's question, I think, gets to what Joe was, was bringing out about uh, those state replies. He asked, uh, how can we reconcile Madison's statement with Article 3, Section 2, which grants the federal judicial power to all cases arising under the Constitution and controversies to which the United States is a party? You know, that's that's uh, in rereading that the, the report of 1800, it's always, you know, every time you reread one of these documents, you're you're struck by additional points. And that's that's a section that I very much had highlighted for our discussion here. And so I appreciate the uh, our, our participant kind of bring this up here. Um, you know, that, and this does get to the point that Joe was making earlier about the compact in that way. And he's speaking specifically about we have a compact here in that way. Or parties are a compact to this in that way. I take, and again, I'm inclined to read Madison in, in the more um, understated version of this or the more modest sense, as we said, if we did sign the Kentucky resolution, we would have, a, have, have, have some, 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 some other matters on the table here. I take Madison again to be making the case here that states have this ability to interpose, to rally the uh, other states to do this. And that that's not prohibited to them in that way. And he's like, so what is the existence? Which I take it the point is, in some ways, isn't there a tribunal above there? So aren't you ignoring the existence of the Supreme Court? And so that's 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 a, that's a fair point in that sense. And it's exactly why the other, that's exactly how other state replies viewed things in that way. I take Madison is is he sidestepping this? Is he interpreting it differently? He's making the case for the existence of the Supreme Court, and it's really does not preclude states from having this ability. Clearly that's 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 the essence of the contest and the disagreement between Madison and the co-state replies. Yeah, I'm willing to defend Madison here, but one has to understand him a particular way to defend him, right? So uh, in a technical sense, of course, the courts are, uh, you know, tribunals in the national government, the laws of the, uh, of the national government are the supreme law of the land, right? Um, assuming that they are constitutional. So I think what Madison is saying here in that, that's a great uh, catch here in the report. He's saying that um, the parties themselves who created the tribunal can't be subordinate to the tribunal that they've created. Right? So he says um, in that same paragraph, uh, the constitution of the United States was formed by the sanction of the states. Um, the states then being the parties to the compact, it follows of necessity there can be no tribunal above their authority to decide in the last resort whether the compact is violated, right? So uh, I think if maybe what he's saying here is that the Supreme Court can't change the nature of the compact, but the states can. And not only through the original making of the Constitution, but of course the amendment process, which is rooted in the states, right? The Supreme Court can't amend the Constitution, at least under the text of the, of the Constitution, but the states can. And so in this sort of legal sense, the states are the superior of the, of the courts. Although from a sort of structural level, the federal courts are the superior of the states. And so what does that mean for Madison? I think what it means is the states can override um, the federal courts, but they'd have to do so in such a way that is consistent with the constitution itself. And Madison gets to this point in the 1830s. So there's this letter, a very long letter uh, to Edward Everett, who uh, on um, the question of nullification, Madison writes this in 1830, and he says, uh, clarifying the, the Virginia resolutions, he says um, that what he meant was, uh, measures known to the Constitution, when he's talking about interposition, uh, measures known to the Constitution, particularly the ordinary control of the people. So I think what he means is elections and then maybe amendments as well. And so the states have that power to override the national tribunals, I think is what he's saying. So there is a sort of, this is the sense in which the states are superior to the courts. Uh, 
it sort of strikes us as counterintuitive, but from a strict legal theory, I think he's right. And so that helps to maybe rein in the most excessive interpretations of the Virginia resolutions, right? That Madison's talking about working within the system to correct these abuses rather than outside of it. And let me just pick up there if I can, because this dovetails with a question that came in from one of the participants bits about to what extent do debates over federalism ultimately boil down to battles for public opinion. And let me take that as a, as a takeoff point. Ultimately, I think Madison, I take Madison to be his on strongest ground, and I believe that this is where he saw himself as he reflects later. He says, ultimately, it's uh, government uh, rests on the opinion of the public and the support of things on, on how the public public support for government actions. And I take Madison in the Virginia resolutions to be trying to rally public opinion. And, uh, and, and, and rally. so he's, he's speaking through the state, uh, sending this to the legislatures of the states. And so clearly it's, it's, he wants actions for the state legislatures, but he really believes that the whole point of this, and Joe guided this earlier, is we're going to rally public opinion and make a constitutional argument and, and about the wrongness of the Alien Sedition Acts. We're going to try to get others to take actions, and if other state legislatures also agree with us, that will rally and, and, and show support in other states. Ultimately, this will be ideally one at the ballot box in that way, or where Congress is led to believe this law has lost the support of the public and it must be changed even, even, even without an election. And so to the answer to the question that came up very helpfully in the chat box, to a, to a big extent, that's what the Virginia resolutions are about, is trying to speak to public. And it's also, I mentioned this earlier, it's also what all these other state resolutions that are being issued, the New England states would join in, would be even more willing, certainly just as willing in, in the Jefferson administration, uh, and, and, and then and again in the Madison administration, to be issuing resolutions that were um, quite critical and believed that the federal government had exceeded its powers in passing an embargo. And they were also trying to rally support they were trying to call attention to in that way. It's one of the reasons actually that um, that, that, that Madison and, um, and Jefferson, when they had the original debate about whether there should be a, a Bill of Rights or not, and the argument came up, a Bill of Rights will be something that people can rally around in that way and see my rights are being violated. So th this this connection with public opinion and the argument that the arguments that are being made here, I would take them at their strongest. Could they go otherwise? Could they be a, pre a, a preliminary towards amending the U.S. Constitution if it needs to be amended? It could, but at its heart, it's an alley. Let's set this out there as a marker and let's see if we can't win at the ballot box or by persuading members of Congress and the president. Yeah, I, can I jump in here just very quickly? Um, one funny thing about this is, would Madison's letters in the 1830s have changed if they had lost the election of 1800? That's a question I always think about here. But the question, I actually have a question for John just to see what you think of this, because um, it's come up a few times and I want to maybe put a, a point of emphasis on it. These, um, these uh, resolutions from these northern states, you know, sort of condemning the, the actions of the Virginia legislature, I always laugh because I know what's going to happen. Once Jefferson and Madison are going to become president, they're going to turn around completely, right, and pass you know all of these resolutions condemning what the Jefferson administration is doing. But of course, they take a step further, uh, or at least this is this is the question, right? Do you think they take that that further step, right, the Hartford Convention, in which they're really talking about nullification and secession? Um, do you think that that goes further than Madison was willing to go here? And if so, you know, what do you make of that? Yeah, and so that's certainly had we been able to assign kind of eight to 10 readings instead of the five readings, and this is always so much kind of um, goes goes into this is what, what's a reasonable amount for us to kind of cover in this time and to ask people to read. The Hartford Convention would be very much one that we kind of kind of put on the put on the table in that way. At its red at its heart. I do take the the Hartford Convention kind of comes out of 1815, where a bunch of, uh, of 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 members of some New England states meet just at the tail end, basically, of kind of the War of 1812, and they're very upset about a lot of things. At root, they are, though, uh, as on my reading, arguing for constitutional change, and they're they're really asking for that. Yes, there were some there was some discussion there 
at this Hartford Convention about let's split off, let's leave. And so that's not absent from it. But at its strongest and read in a way that we've been reading Madison to kind of go on his, his strongest arguments, um, if we read the Hartford Convention that way, a lot of what they're setting out is we believe that there's constitutional problems and it's time to rally to, to get a constitutional amendment structured to amend some of the problems that we see. And so um, so I'm inclined to kind of see it as, an, as a continuum. Who, who really takes things to the next level is, of course, Calhoun and South Carolina. Carolina, and that is, and 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 we'll we'll put that on the table as um, here when at, at a suitable time, and some of the the participants have already raised questions about that. Um, you know, there we have Calhoun expressing doctrines, and it's a kind of a classic kind of line here. He says, just in the very kind of first or second paragraph of it, he says, "This right of interposition, thus solemnly asserted by the state of Virginia, be it called what it may, states' rights." veto, nullification, or by any other name. And then it goes on. Well, there's a lot of work being done in that. And as Madison comes back and says, hold on a second, hold on. Um, let's be clear about what, what I was arguing at the time. And so that that's where I, I, I take the real leap being made. And, and um, perhaps there, there's this, the seeds for that are being sowed earlier, but it, it's Calhoun that takes it completely to the next level. That's, that's great. That's really helpful. Um, and I just, I'll be quick here because I know we have to get through questions, but uh, I have sort of sometimes taught the Hartford Convention a little differently. So that's really helpful to hear that. Um, uh, it's one point here maybe worth uh, sort of just reflecting on very briefly is how tough these questions are for them because they have no precedence to work with on like the acceptable scope of opposition to the federal government. And what are the boundaries of politics? I mean, thinking of today, right, where you know, so people are at, I think, a point where they see things fraying very quickly in terms of national elections and opposition to, to the government. I think this makes a lot of this material really interesting because they're working through some of the same things. How far do we go in, oppo in opposition? Where are the limits? They're testing the boundaries. And I think it's, it's really fruitful to see how they really grappled carefully with these questions. Such a fascinating conversation. I, I, I'm <laughs> I have such a great job. I could just sit here and listen to you two, these two great minds go back and forth on these really, really important questions, really interesting stuff. Uh, as, as, as both of you have remarked, right, we've got questions coming in from the audience, and please, folks, keep those coming. We've got several here about, right, the nullification crisis of, of the 1830s, so I'm going to try to maybe combine a, a couple of those. So jumping ahead then to the 1830s, Madison uh, he makes it very clear in 1835 and in, in the document that we read his notes on nullification from December of 35, uh, Madison makes it clear that the nullification crisis and John C. Calhoun are definitely not following the precedent of Virginia in 1798. Uh, can you walk us through that distinction of, of interposition versus nullification? Because it's interesting, right? I mean, Jefferson's no longer alive in the 1830s, he dies in 1826, but Madison's still around and here's Calhoun, right? You're saying, I'm just following in the steps of, of James Madison, right? Interposition, nullification, call it what you will by any name whatsoever, it's it's the same thing. Is Here's the question from our audience. Was Madison's argument against nullification in the 1830s mainly procedural or were they grounded in fear that the American Civil War would happen as a result? Um, interposition versus nullification. Um, what's the distinction? Do you want to go there, John, or do you want me to take it? Or go, 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 start right off, and let me. Okay, and, please. Sure. So I, th I think the, the basic difference, of course, is that nullification has a very clear sort of remedy for, and a very clear instrument for the remedy. Right, one state within its boundaries can basically refuse to enforce a law. You know, in the 1830s, there's no really powerful federal bureaucracy to directly enforce the law inside of a state. I mean, clearly they have, say, customs collectors, they have a post office, they have, you know, so they have marshals, but it's not like today where the federal government can reach directly into the states with a lot of enforcement authority and they don't really have to worry about whether the states will comply, right? Um, so I think uh, this was, of course, the collection of the tariff and South Carolina basically says, we're going to not allow the tariff to be collected or you know, enforced here. Um, I don't think interposition 
uh, is committal on any particular remedy, right? This is a lot of the discussion so far we've been saying, you know, Madison's not entirely clear what he means by it. But what he does mean is it has to be exercised collectively, right, by multiple states. And it is, um, eventually he comes to the position that it happens within the constitution. So it's the ordinary control you have over the government that is through elections. Um, so that's the most immediate distinction, say, between interposition and nullification. I do think, and this gets to one of the questions I saw raised in the Q&A, uh, even though the Kentucky resolution and the, the Virginia resolutions are often joined together for obvious reasons, you know, in terms of timing and the authors, I think it's, this, there's a very important distinction between the two. And Madison himself rejects the doctrine of the Kentucky resolutions uh, in terms of the, the nullification principle there. So they should, I think, really be taught as very different in terms of the, the approaches that they take to the question. Um, you know, and then I guess the last thing to say here is at the deepest level, and again, this is, this is Madison, I think, caught in a subtlety that he's really having a hard time getting out of, is the, the view of the compact that undergirds both uh, nullification and interposition, right? So for Calhoun in the Fort Hill Address, he's very explicit. The states created the national government Therefore, this gives them greater authority to resist, to pull out of, of, of the government, to secede, and so on, um, and to nullify. Um, Madison's view is much more subtle and much more hard to, to sort out, which is, you know, the people created the, the Constitution, right? We, the people, ratified the Constitution. But we didn't just hold one national election and say whoever wins that election gets to uh, gets to win the debate, right? It wasn't a national election between Federalists and, and Anti-Federalists. It was nine thirteenths of the states acting in convention. And so who made the Constitution at the end of the day for Madison? Was it the people or was it the states? And Madison says it was both. And that ambiguity, I think, is how Calhoun can take some of his comments and try to try to sort of take them in a more radical direction. Um, so, so that question of who made the Constitution, I think, is the fundamental question that divides, say, interposition and nullification. And let me just, uh, I'm looking at a paragraph in the notes on Madison's 1835 uh, document, beginning under these circumstances. It's the fifth from the, the, the last paragraph. It's kind of about two thirds of the way through. And, and here, here's, here's Madison coming back kind of, you know, um, several decades after writing the, the resolutions and saying, here's what we meant in that way. He says, under these circumstances, the subject was taken up by Virginia in her resolutions. Her main object evidently being to produce a conviction everywhere that the Constitution had been violated by the obnoxious acts and to procure a concurrence and cooperation of the other states in effectuating a repeal of the acts. That's Madison uh, putting, um, saying, here's what we were doing at that time. Now, clearly, folks, Madison, um, you know, there's different shades of emphasis for Madison at the convention of 1787 to kind of Madison in the 1790s. But here's Madison saying, this is what we were meaning to do. And key terms there a concurrence and cooperation of other states. So it's a coordinated effort. And he says, ideally, we were starting to effectuate a repeal of the acts. She accordingly asserted, this is Virginia, and offered her proofs at great length that the acts were unconstitutional. She asserted moreover and offered her proofs that states had a right in such cases to interpose. And then he goes on. He actually does address in this paragraph the existence of the Supreme Court. Here he kind of takes this on at the final sentence of this paragraph. He acknowledges that he said, of course, there is a tribunal. And he says that tribunal, the Supreme Court, might be the last resort under the Constitution for cases falling within the scope of its jurisdictions, could not preclude an interposition of the states as the parties which made the Constitution, and Joe was getting into this as well, what exactly to me by it. My point is, there's a big difference here between what Madison is saying in 1835 about what was being asserted in the Virginia Resolution and what Calhoun and South Carolina are now asserting in the 1830s. Calhoun is saying an individual state in South Carolina has the ability to nullify, to say in our state, this federal act is no longer uh, applicable and, and, and is, is null and void in particular. Madison is saying, no, one state cannot do that. He says, I'm not talking about a natural right of some face of it, but in a certain sense of revolution or ultimate resistance when in the ultimate. He says, but I'm saying, you're, 
you do not have the ability and it would not make sense for a single state to simply have this power. One of the participants here offered a, 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 a comment earlier, what's the limiting principle to Calhoun's and South Carolina's argument, and that's very, uh, very reasonable. And Calhoun says, "Oh, the limiting principle is going to be the the good faith of the people who are kind of have have, have struggled through through war and blood, sweat, and tears." So, so clearly, he said this wouldn't be misused. But Madison and others see this could this, this it's very difficult to have a limiting principle. So this is Madison's case to say there's a huge difference. Please do not. Madison saying use the Virginia resolutions in the report of 1800 as supporting the doctrines that are being put forward here. He wants to draw as stark of a difference as possible. Uh, yeah, this is it. That's great. So um, Madison also has the benefit of the experience of his own presidency to say, like, I can see how the good faith of all of the members isn't going to be enough to make sure that people exercise this this right responsibly of, of nullification. Um, there is, though, you know, this is another interesting point, right? Uh, um, uh, I think John just mentioned sort of like the the you know right to revolution uh, and uh, how that fits in here. Um, what I find interesting about the, I think this is the, uh, this is the the 1835 notes, or it might actually be the 1800 report, where there are a couple of phrases from the Declaration of Independence that slip in here. Um, so I'm thinking of the, uh, the this is the 1800 report uh, at the end. So I think this is a, a paragraph that says, the resolution has accordingly guarded against any misapprehension of its object. Um, he says, by expressly requiring, this is now the Virginia resolutions, require a deliberate, palpable, and dangerous breach of the Constitution, right? So he's saying, we, you don't even do interposition, forget nullification, you don't even do interposition unless it's deliberate, palpable, and dangerous, right? It's got to be a big deal before the states start passing these resolutions. And then in the next sentence, he says, it must be a case not of a light and transient nature, but of a nature dangerous to the great purposes for which the constitution was established. Now, light and transient doesn't appear there out of nowhere, of course. That's the famous line in the Declaration of Independence that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And so um, Madison's almost working a kind of revolutionary principle in here. Um, but the point here, of course, is that uh, the constitution itself should be relied upon. But even these kinds of semi-extreme measures like interposition have to be justified on a very serious basis. You don't enter into these kinds of uh, measures for very small reasons. Very good stuff. Such an interesting conversation. And, and I'm, I'm so happy that so many of our, our teachers out in the audience are able to contribute questions. And ladies and gentlemen, please please keep those questions coming because we're, we're quickly running out of time here. We're, we're coming down to our, our last uh, quarter hour or so. Uh, and so I'd like to maybe bring the conversation back to where it began, where we were talking about, okay, what does this mean for understanding politics in 2022? Um, so what does this question mean for us in the present day? Uh, let's talk about some contemporary manifestations of, of states challenging federal policies, states today declining to help enforce federal laws and even uh, passing laws inconsistent with federal statutes. We have a lot of questions coming in from our audience members uh, asking about precedents in modern American history on this issue. Uh, I think earlier in the, the, the webinar, John, you mentioned state marijuana laws, New Jersey passing a sports gambling law inconsistent with federal gambling law. Uh, so let's talk about that. Where are the, the precedents here today? So here's, and let me just add one or two others that I didn't mention earlier, just to kind of um, keep things before us. And, and we have a reference to gun laws that's, that's mentioned in, yes. in the chat room as well. In, and let me, let, here's the one I want to focus on. So after the Affordable Care Act is passed in 2010, and it has a requirement that all individuals purchase health insurance, uh, several states actually passed laws saying no one in this state shall be required to purchase health insurance, a direct uh, at variance with the uh, constitutional, the Congressional Act that was passed in the Affordable Care Act. So this is a, of, of a piece uh, of, with several uh, other states have done similar things. Here's the key though, and the important in my view, in 
all of the cases today where this is used, at least all the cases where they're used kind of in a, in, in a way that would be considered reasonable, it is with an eye towards getting the case to the federal courts and in the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, this is different, very different from what Madison is arguing in the 1790s in that way. So when people are, the whole point of these laws, at least some people might have think that by passing a, um, this, this, uh, uh, the, the state law saying you can't uh, be required to purchase health insurance, they might have thought that they were actually kind of, um, that was the final word on it. But the folks who were actually drafting these with any forethought and, under, and knowledge of the constitutional system, in my view, were doing so with values. Let's set up a conflict between state and federal law with an eye towards getting this before the U.S. Supreme Court. Let me give another very, very recent example. The U.S., we've been talking about challenges to congressional acts. But how about at variance with U.S. Supreme Court decisions? So U.S. Supreme Court Roe versus Wade and the Casey decision were very clear that abortion could not be prohibited prior to the point of fetal viability. And yet in the last decade, a number of states, including Mississippi, passed laws which prohibit abortions at an earlier point in time in that sense. Well, that's at variance, clearly at variance with what the U.S. Supreme Court had set down, just as these uh, anti-health care mandate uh, provisions were at variance with congressional acts. They were done so, and people in the states of Mississippi, and those were very clear, were doing these with an eye towards getting them before the U.S. Supreme Court, with the U.S. Supreme Court given an opportunity to say this, um, to revise its interpretation of Roe versus Wayne Casey, which the Supreme Court did in fact do this summer in Dobbs, or in the case of the health care laws, to get, they say, we want to challenge, we want to get a legal resolution of what the legitimacy of the Affordable Care Act by passing a law at variance with that, we believe that increases the chances of this moving through. So it, that's one manifestation. I'll, I'll just one other example here, and then there's so much to, to be talked about. Very clear, we should be very clear about what's going on in the marijuana laws. And for those of us in the classroom, we know that the entry to federalism and discussions of federalism today is very much oftentimes through marijuana laws. In an earlier generation, it was through the drinking age um, cases. It was the idea that we had a uniform drinking age raised to 21 for all intents and purposes in the Reagan administration. And that was our entree into federalism. Um, I believe federalism stands on its own. It needs no kind of introduction or needs no illustration, but I also understand that of, that there's a reason for drunk kids. In the marijuana case, let's be very clear what's happened. The states have not in any way nullified federal law and declared it null and void. What they have said is they might be federal criminal penalties for marijuana. We are removing all state criminal penalties and we will therefore not be prosecuting under state law and, and, and most likely not assisting in the, in the federal prosecution. But of course, Federal prosecutors could decide if they wanted to in Colorado and Washington, the first states to legalize recreational marijuana, and, and you know, so that could still be prosecuted. They're not standing against that. It was the choice of the federal government and various justice departments to say, we will not prosecute or enforce federal law in states with contrary law. So what's what's on the, at, their, at their best today, when states are issuing resolutions or laws of this kind, they're doing so certainly far short of anything that Calhoun is asserting here. And they're even in many cases doing so in a different way than Madison was envisioning. Madison was not saying, and we're passing these laws so the US Supreme Court can ultimately rule on those. That's oftentimes what's being said today. Let me stop here because I've already put a lot on the table. I think that's fantastic. I mean, I just really want to underscore the, the fundamental point that John is making because I firmly agree with it it's it's you see sort of like shades of what they're talking about back then and what some states are doing today but it's so different right because it's either say the executive branch is not enforcing its federal authority inside a state and we think that's hap that's sort of causing decriminalization but it's that's not really states opposing or even interposing uh certainly it's not states nullifying uh and then of course so that's on the executive side at the national level and of course most most of this is the judicial uh process they're trying to get this into the federal 
federal courts, which is precisely the thing that Madison is resisting, right? That that dynamic that the federal courts should resolve this, that's what the state responses to the Virginia resolutions are saying, right? The states can't interpose because the federal courts will resolve this. And so uh, I had not really thought about Dobbs being essentially this question, right? That the state of Mississippi strategically passed a law that was in opposition to uh, the federal constitution as applied by the Supreme Court in, in Roe and Casey in order to get the federal courts to, to, to decide this question. So there's, I mean, of the, all of the issues that people are talking about these days, that's one of the central issues, clearly, and that's tied right back to these debates. Um, the uh, other thing I'll say, just to put a little bit of extra, um, you know, sort of example on this, is the rise in uh, what is called standing to sue uh, to state attorneys general. So if you look at some of the names of the big cases, especially in environmental law over the last few years, West Virginia versus EPA, Massachusetts versus EPA, Michigan versus EPA, it's actually uh, the federal courts facilitating this process of having the states bring their claims to the federal courts by opening up standing to sue to state attorneys general who want to oppose the EPA, the federal EPA's rules and regulations on environmental air quality. So in a way, we've sort of created an actual legal mechanism for the states to bring their claims in opposition to federal law straight to the federal courts so that these can be resolved. And so this, this is, I think, the new nature of these um, of these claims. And I think in a way, Madison would probably be, be quite disappointed that this is the route we've gone because he, I think he really wants this to be settled by an open debate politically by the people reflecting and deliberating on these things. Yeah, that's, that's the perfect transition here to, to another question from an audience member to, to keep this ball rolling about what does this question mean for us today? Um, what is the current state of federalism today, and what are its future prospects? This person in particular asked, do we foresee any prospect of the Supreme Court uh, restoring a traditional interpretation of federalism? And, and this person asked in particular, is an expansive interpretation of the Commerce Clause here to stay? You guys, you don't have to answer the, that part maybe about the Commerce Clause, but what are the future prospects? Uh, what, what does that look like for federalism? Well, let me just take an opening start at that, and this I'm going to bring together a question that was also brought in the chat room earlier. Someone said, wait, is this our question, our arguments based on federalism done in, in uh, uh, for political expediency, or are they done kind of out of principle or put another way? And in one sense, so many arguments in American politics uh, depends on where you sit. You might love the filibuster in the U.S. Senate when you're in the minority, and you might really not like it when you hold the presidency in a majority. And yet um, things can change. And next thing you know, you start to kind of become appreciative of the virtues of the filibuster. In some sense, this seems hypocritical. Uh, same thing with executive power. You can really, if you don't hold the presidency, you can say this is so improper that a president would regard, rely on executive orders, would rely on administrative rulemaking to achieve goals. This is so wrong. And the next thing you know, your party gains the presidency and you, you become impressed by the virtue. So in that way, sometimes federalism is viewed this way as if it's, as if it's unique in the fact that people who might um, be out of power at the federal level might, um, might, might make use of or, or the state officials and state power to contest federal power. And I would see it as in far more in keeping with American politics. So I say that the very fact that you can have when Trump was in office and president, that you could have some Democratic attorneys general and Democratic controlled states being some of the most aggressive in terms of state attorneys general doing what Joe said of challenging Trump's travel ban or challenging Trump's environmental or health care orders and in uh, declining to, uh, to, to assist federal officials in enforcing immigration law. And then we have Biden in, in office and presidency and the shoe is back on the other foot and it's Republican attorneys general who are challenging things and also uh, Republicans controlled states passing things. To me, that is healthy. It is healthy that we have an ability for states to serve in this sense, I would see it as, it, as in keeping with Madison, although we've right sort of as rallying. In some ways, that is ultimately an effort to rally public opinion in many of these cases of states and to have that kind of um, that other ability. As, as federal government 
cannot um, is very limited in its ability to implement federal policies and its ability to do things state officials are oftentimes in the best position to talk back and say what is possible and to present other views that aren't currently represented so i'll, I'll stop there in that sense federalism my view is alive and well when you see members across the political aisle embracing that in ways um, in, in a very healthy way i would say um, yeah, I, I actually would echo this notion that federalism is alive and well. I mean, COVID, if anything, taught us that the state governments matter a lot more than we've traditionally recognized and appreciated, but also in a host of other ways that are more ordinary and less focused on temporary emergencies, you know, uh, schools, roads, um, land use. Uh, interestingly, the, 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 when you read the federalist anti-federalist debates, the Federalists assume over and over again that the people will care a lot more about what happens at the state level than they will care about what happens at the national level. That whether you have access to courts of law, whether you have good schools, whether you have good roads, these things are going to matter a lot more to you than you know what's going on with the treat the Jay Treaty between the United States and, and Great Britain. Um, that everything that they say there makes sense, right? We care about government in a more practical way? Is it, you know, allowing us to live our lives in a way that like uh, we can flourish? Um, and so it does seem to me like the states matter a lot more than we recognize. And I wish uh, that, you know, sort of Americans would, would pay a little more attention to what happens at the state level and attach a little bit more of their affection and their, their interest to those proceedings, which I think affect them a lot more than they typically uh, believe. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in a sort of national debate, right? Think of like people talk about California and Texas and Florida as if they're governed very differently, as as if the people who who are elected in those states matter, and yet we still tend to talk about our government as if it's way uh, if it's, as it's, if it's been more centralized than it really has. Jason, I know you're looking at the clock and we're expired. How about just 30 seconds of picking up from Joe and responding to a comment there? The last comment was, have we morphed into a kind of situation where things are decided by judges rather than the electorate? And let me just pick up the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision this summer is very much an opportunity to say that we will not be any longer determining abortion policy and the extent of abortion rights at the Supreme Court level. It will now be determined by the people and officials of the various states. So yes, in one sense, we can see a trend towards uh, deferring to judges, and I gave some earlier examples, and yet this summer and the Supreme Court's ruling in Dobbs is a, is a reminder that um, that is very much in the electorate and the state policy going forward. That's a really, really good point. And yes, we, we, we are unfortunately now out of time, but I wanna give both of you maybe just a, a quick second or two here. Uh, what is a book or a, another original primary source um, that uh, those in our audience should read or take, a, take another look at uh, if they wanna learn more about this, this topic? I'll just, I mentioned this earlier, as a book by Herman Ames, the Herman V. Ames, it was a, about 100 uh, some years ago, uh, Documents on State Federal Relations is just, it's, it's actually available open source if you go on, uh, on, on online. And it, when I've been referring to some of these resolutions from the New England states or resolutions from uh, Pennsylvania, some of the mid-Atlantic states, that's a great collection of working through what's happening, what role are states playing in those first 50 years. And then another book is, um, there's an editor a book called Nullification and Secession in Modern Constitutional Thought. It's edited by Sanford Levinson. Has a number of great contributors in that sense who've thought about, have tried to kind of bring some of these questions as we've been doing today about what does it mean, some of these kind of uh, doctrines today. Uh, I'll mention one br brief primary source, and that is a speech by Patrick Henry at the Virginia Ratifying Convention, mm -hmm. where he says, the whole Constitution has been shaped by the first three words, we the people, rather than we the states. And he says, this Constitution is founded on the power of the people, not that of the states. And this is what concerns Patrick Henry, because mm -hmm. he thinks that this is leading it to a more consolidated, centralized system. So um, the debates we've been having about the nature of the compact, that speech by Patrick Henry is exceptionally good and clear mm -hmm. about the, the dynamics we've been talking about here. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent, very good. You know, as always, the, the conversation, right, is just so good. It, the, the time just flies by. We're already over our time. So uh, I'll just have to say thanks to our, our panelists as well as to our participants for some really great questions this morning. 
Uh, as a reminder, within the next week, you will receive an email that will include links to today's readings, suggested further readings on today's topic, uh, and a link to the archived webinar. We hope you will share this information with your colleagues as well as on social media. Uh, if you have enjoyed today's webinar, please consider taking an online graduate course in our Masters of Arts in American History and Government program, our MAG program. You can find more information about online course offerings, as well as many other resources for teachers at teachingamericanhistory.org, TAH.org. This has been the third episode of American Controversies. The program will return on December 3rd when we will ask this question, is the Constitution a living document? Uh, thanks so much for being with us here today. Uh, thank you to our panelists, John and Joe. Always, always a pleasure getting to, to speak with the two of you. I learned a lot. Uh, I hope you all did too. Uh, and we'll look forward to, to seeing everybody next month. Thanks all, we'll see you then. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to Teaching American History's webinar on federalism. For more information on our webinars, impersonal educator professional development programs, free document library, and graduate programs, please visit us at teachingamericanhistory.org.